just appreciate the Lord for uh, the opportunity to be here today. Uh, man, I have felt I have felt His presence here today. I've been plumb beside. I, I mean, you may not have recognized it or seen it, but I have been plumb beside myself ever since we started service. And uh, I don't know how to describe it. God's doing something. Amen. I heard somebody talking about when the children of Israel, after Moses had already left, and uh, Moses had given Joshua the charge of the nation of Israel, that they were getting ready to step through the Jordan River. And you know, the Jordan is a type of separation. And uh, the children of Israel came out of the, the wilderness and they crossed that Jordan River they were forever separated from what was behind them. And I feel that, that in a sense, we're crossing the Jordan. I feel like God is doing something, that he's taking us somewhere. And it's not just me. I know that, that God has been dealing with your heart as well. And uh, we've, we've prayed about it. We've, we've talked about it. We've hoped for it. We've looked for that final pull, that final anointing. Brothers and sisters, this thing has to end sometime. Amen. Amen. I don't know how much longer we have. But I know that I'm 58 years old. I don't know how many, how many more years that I have. I believe that when I'm gone... That there'll be somebody, if the Lord tarries, that there'll be, there'll be somebody that can step in to my shoes or to somebody else's shoes. And that's what we should be preparing for. We should be encouraging young men. We should be encouraging the body of Christ to be able to, I don't know, I could, get, I could be killed in a car accident tomorrow. And so we can't rest completely, just like what Brother Lonnie was saying, upon a certain individual because we don't have promise of tomorrow, so therefore we need to be preparing and encouraging others to step in and to take their position within the body of Christ. This is a body work. This is something that God is doing within the body. And so the rapture of the church, you know, um, how foolish sometimes it, it is to talk about spiritual things, just like Jim was saying, Job, he said, I will see him for myself. All through the scripture, people seen, I believe, through the spirit, they seen things that they didn't see with their natural eye, but they seen with their spiritual eye. And some of the things that people seen were kind of foolish to man's understanding. Yeah. You know, it's just like the scripture, people talk about the, the foolishness of preaching. Well, it's not the screaming and the the uh, yelling and the spitting and the sputtering. And, and actually, when you look at other translations of that, it says the foolishness of the thing preached. And that being that Jesus, a man, would die on the cross and be buried and be, be resurrected from the dead. But that's not even the best part. I mean, it's a miracle within itself that Jesus died and rose again. But when he, oh, hallelujah, when he rose... He set the captivity free. Amen. He set those that were in bondage. All those thousands of years prior to the resurrection. He, that was the big miracle. That Jesus, not that he, it was unbelievable that he could raise from the dead. But that when he did, he set you and I free. He made a way, he provided a way where those that were in bondage could be set free. See, that's the miracle. The title of the message today is, Are You Buying What Is Being Sold? Are You Buying What Is Being Sold? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for being here today. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Oh, God, we ask you, Lord, humbly as we know how, Father, that you would anoint, Lord, my voice, my thoughts. Lord, don't, don't let it be read green junior any longer, but Lord, let it be the Holy Ghost. Let it be the anointing of your word that flows, Lord, through my mouth. Lord, Lord let me articulate 
the words and the thoughts, God, in a way that can be understood and that can be held on to by, by even those that are, are, are babes in Christ. And even the older, older ones, the more mature ones, Lord, let it be something that even they can latch on to, Lord, and even grow by. That's the wonderful thing about your word, Lord. It can be different things to different people. And so, Father, we just ask that you would anoint, that you would help me, Lord, as a vessel of God, Lord, to be as humble as I know how to be, Lord, and allow your spirit to guide us through your word and teach us and instruct us, Lord, the things that we need in 2020. Lord, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to turn to St. John, the book of St. John, chapter 2, verse 13. The title again is, Are You Buying What Is Being Sold? Are You Buying What Is Being Sold? St. John chapter 2, verse 13. And it says, And the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And I'm going to read down to verse 19. And he found in the temple those who were who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers seated. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and turned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews therefore answered and said, These were the Jewish leaders. The Jews therefore answered and said, What sign do you show us, seeing that you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Again, the title of the message is, Are You Buying What Is Being Sold? Let me just give you a, a little background of what was happening here. This was right prior to the Passover, and when people would come from all over the world into Jerusalem that were proselytes, they had accepted the Jewish faith, the city of Jerusalem would swell I think I read someplace ten times more than what it was in normal capacity. And there would be as many as two to two and a half million people in and around Jerusalem to come in and offer a sacrifice to the temple. And so they would what they would do when they would go into this outer court area, this is where Jesus was at when he, he made the cords or a whip and he beat the money changers out of the out of the temple, they call that the Gentile uh, arena or the place where a Gentile was allowed to come. You couldn't go no further than that, but this was a place where they set up tables kind of like this, maybe like a yard sale or whatever, and people would come from all over the world with different types of coins, and some of those coins had inscriptions of idols and, and false gods, and so for, before they could offer that, that tax or that payment, and they said the tax was... Uh, the, what they had to pay was about two days' wages. Before they could offer that money to the temple, they had to exchange their coins, which was, was inscribed with other gods and other deities, and they would have to inscribe it with the national coin of Israel so it could be uh, the right type of coin that they could offer to the temple, you see. And so there was people around in these tables, and when they, when they would come and they would exchange one coin for another, there was a charge that was applied to that. And so when they once they got their money, then they could go and they could buy the dove or they could buy the lamb or they could buy whatever they needed. And so what was, what was basically happy, happening was these people were coming in. They felt so in, in bondage to be able to come in and offer this sacrifice that, that many times history says that they were robbed, they were cheated, and, and they lost, many of them lost their whole inheritance because of these cheaters and these swindlers that were supposed to have been in the house of God. They basically turned what was supposed to have been the house of God into a place of merchandise. And it was so bad that, that sometimes they would lose everything. But here's the thing about it. 
the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders of that time, that's why they despised Jesus so much because he come into this place and they received a portion of all of these funds that was going in. And so they were so angry with Jesus that he would do something like this. That's why they wanted him crucified. And so these people come in and basically what was happening was these Jewish leaders were making merchandise off the people's sin. Because they sinned, they felt this obligation to come in to the temple and offer up these sacrifices. And the, the, the priests and those that were involved in charge of the temple, they were making money and they were making profit off of what was taking place. So basically, the people sinned, the burden that these people had on them. They were making merchandise of what, what was going on. And we see that today in religion, religious circles. You see, you can turn it on, you can turn the TV on, and people will say, Well, if you'll send us money, see that same spirit is still here today. Amen. Amen. If you'll send us money, then we'll send you a prayer cloth, or we'll send you some anointing oil, or we'll send you this book, or we'll send you this. See, people are making profit off of people's sin. And you know, in, in our society today, with all the social media and, and the, the internet and all the Amazon and the eBay and all these things, people, there's always something to buy. People are always trying to sell you something. Amen. People are always, they're looking for something to buy. They're looking for something to sell. There's always something to buy. But we've got two choices, brothers and sisters. We can buy into the fear that this world has. I've talked about this so much. We can allow Satan to come in and, and bind us up so much that, that, that we are, we're afraid to move. We're afraid to breathe. We're afraid to, to, to worship God, to come to the house of God. Yes, I understand that this thing is real and we've got to use wisdom. But see, there's people that's selling something and I want to make sure that we don't buy something that we don't need. See, there's all you can turn on. I you can just scroll through the news, or you watch TV and watch the news, or watch anything, and somebody's always trying to sell somebody something. Oh, we've got what you need. No matter what tool or what item or what I, a piece of clothing or or what a piece of uh, uh, technology that you that you need, we've got it. We've got something to sell. Well, it's just the same way in the natural world. There's people out there that's trying to sell us something. And we've got to make sure we stay away from it. See, here what was going on in the temple was a mixture of profane and holy things. They were trying to mix the things of God with the profane things of the world. It's, it's already been said here today. Brother Lonnie's talked about it. Brother Jim's talked about it. People, you, you go on social media... And I know I've mentioned this before, but you go on social media and one minute a person's talking about, oh, pray for me. And, and they're talking about Bible verses. And then the next thing you know that they're, they're putting something immoral or decent or they're, they're cursing and they're swarping and carrying on and acting in such an ungodly way. How can the profane and the holy be mixed together? It can't be. That's why even in our life, we've got to make sure there are certain standards and there are certain things that God wants us to do. We can read through the Word of God and understand that when, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, there's a righteousness and a holiness. And there's something about us that when we, as I mentioned yesterday at the baptism, when we go down in that water, it's, it's a sign or it's, a, it's something that we're saying we're separate from the world. I don't remember... It, if somebody mentioned it here, but Samson has been on my mind. Did somebody mention about Samson here today? We could have sleep in giants. You might have thought about that when I was talking about the church being asleep. See, Samson was anointed of God to be a judge. But Samson didn't buy into completely the power and the strength that God desired for him to. There was always something that he wanted part of the world and he wanted part of God. He wanted the power when it came to fighting the enemies. He wanted, he wanted to be able to go out and kill a thousand Philistines and to be able to fight like a, a mighty warrior. It was mentioned this morning. I, was, I went to church this morning and they were talking about Samson. And this one man mentioned, he said, I never really thought about it, but he said, when I thought, I've always thought about Samson, he said, as, as this Arnold Schwarzenegger type fellow. 
But he said, I, I'm not really sure that it was. He said, I believe it may have been more like a Pee Wee Herman type villain. <laughs> because how better could God show his power and his strength to just an ordinary person? See, we're just ordinary people. There's nothing really special about us other than we've got Jesus Christ living with us. Amen. And so Samson was, he was, he had that anointing, he had that power, but he never did buy in completely to the idea of God's holiness and God's righteousness. See, here's the thing people think, well, if Samson, his strength was his hair, but you know, really, the Bible says Samson was a Nazarite. And the thing that, that what brought Samson's strength was his separation. When he separated himself from the things of the world, when he separated himself from, from, the, the, from the temptations that, that he faced, when he separated himself from those things, that's where the power of God was displayed in his life. You know, the Jews, they had 613 added above the Ten Commandments. They added 613 laws and regulations. And it was such a burden. And these people that was in and around the temple, they were burdened down by these 613 laws. There was no way that they could fulfill them because here was the thing about the law, that if you offended in one area of the law, you, were, you offended in the whole area of the law. We cannot live particularly by the, by the written law. God is writing His laws on the table of our heart and He's changing us from the inside out. But it can't be from the inside, from the outside in. It's got to start on the inside and go out. But here's what we have to do. We have to understand that we've got to buy in to what God is doing, lock, stock, and barrel. We cannot say, well, I'm going to save this part for myself, or I'm going to put this, I'm going to have this room over here, and it's just for me. And God, you're not allowed. But when we expect the power of God, or we desire truly the power of God in our life, then we've got to buy into what God is doing in our day and age. Because the world wants to sell you something. I made up a word the other day. Here it goes. Religiotainment. Religiotainment. You know what that is, don't you? We've got it here in Beckham. The biggest church with all the smoke and all the bells and whistles and who can get the most here. You can do anything you want. You can, you can come at, in your pajamas if you want. You can, you, can, uh, you can wear nothing or you can wear your winter coat or whatever. You just come and, and you know, we're, we're going to accept you. But, you know, that's true in the beginning. If we're seeking something and God is pointing us, I don't care how they come in. I want them to come in anyway. But pretty soon when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you, then pretty soon you're going to start changing you know, Legion, when he was out there in the tomb, the, the Bible says he was naked, he didn't have any clothes on. But it said when God touched him, when the power of God touched this man, it said the next place they found him was at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. But see, brothers and sisters, people think that we can live in a world where we can buy part of this and buy part of that. You know what? I don't want the world. I don't want to buy into the things of the world. I don't want to live with one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. One foot in hell and one foot in heaven. It doesn't work that way. We've got to buy and sell out to one or the other. Amen. Listen, I don't have anything against anybody. But I've heard so much just here recently, just in the last little bit. Well, you know, we like sermons that are 30 minutes long. You know, we don't like the preacher to get too loud. We want one song before the sermon and one song after. And, you know, we can say, it's all right if we say a prayer, you know. You know, we got to say at least one prayer so we can feel good about ourselves. And just come as you are, and I don't have to worry about changing. I can be the same person I've always been. Well, that's the problem. That's the problem. People don't buy in to the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't buy in to being set free by the gospel. Brothers and sisters, when the Holy Ghost comes into us, He sets us free. I believe in time that when Jesus went in to the temple, see the Passover was a celebration when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. It was a celebration and commemoration of their freedom. 
But here they were at the temple before Passover and they were more bound than they were when they were down there in Egypt making the bricks. They were bound by man's regulations. They were bound by the money system. They were bound by man's greed. They were bound by the things that, that man wanted to put on them. They were still bound by sin. Can you imagine? I heard somebody tell them a story the other day. They said, they kind of put themselves in the situation. You know, I go in to the temple and I get my money changed and I buy me a dub because that's all I can afford. I've taken all of my savings and I, buy, I bought this dove or this, or this pigeon or whatever. And, you know, I take it in to the priest and they offer it up. See, see the, people don't realize, but see, they, they used to call the, the, the Jews' religion the bloody religion. On the day of Passover, when they would offer up those sacrifices, they said the blood would flow out of the temple like area like a stream of water. There were so many animals sacrificed. But here's this guy. Here I go in and I buy this turtle dove and I take it to the priest. And you know, it really doesn't do anything for your sin. All it does is just clear your conscience just a little bit till the next year. And I give, him the, I give him the turtle dove. He offers it up as a sacrifice. And I go out of the temple. And I'm walking back home. And somebody runs their cart over my, my toe. And I start cursing the guy. And I think, I've got to go back to the temple again. I've got to go buy another turtle dove. Or I've got to go buy another pigeon. You know, and before I get there, I, I get mad. And I, I, I curse somebody else. See, that's the way the Jews' religion was. It didn't last no time. You, they people bought into it. They give all that they had. They sacrificed everything they had just to get a little bit of peace of mind, but they could never find it. Brothers and sisters, if we'll buy in to the gospel of Jesus Christ and we'll allow the Spirit of God to come into our life and truly set us free, set us free from the things of this world, set us free from the life that we used to have, set us free from addiction and the problems that we face because you know what? You're going to be in bondage to one thing or another. I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. The scripture, I read this scripture last week, I think. Isaiah 55 and 1. It says, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. Everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, come by and eat. Come by wine, milk, without money, without cost. How do you do that? How do you buy without money? How do you buy See, they were, they were given their life savings sometimes. They were, history says that they would lose their homes because they would have to borrow money to be able to offer up the proper sacrifice that they needed. And it still wasn't enough to clear their conscience. But yet people were making a profit on it and they were buying into that. Brothers and sisters, the same thing is just as real today. People want to say, well, I've got this and I've got that. And there's people by the droves buying into that, but it's, it's not the right way to go. It's not the thing that's going to set you free. So it says, Isaiah 55 and 1 says, come and buy, come and eat. Come and drink and buy. How do we buy? We give ourselves. We give ourselves. We say, God, here I am. Whatever you want for me. God, whatever you want for my life, I'm willing to do it. God, I'm willing to walk through that open door. God, I'm willing to come into that place of fellowship with you. See, when we buy and listen, when we buy into the things of religion, when we buy into the things of the world, we end up in a greater bondage than we were to start with. People are going to church every day. And I don't have anything against, again, to be repetition, I don't have anything against anybody or any other church. But here's the thing. People are buying into that and they're not, they're not going to get any higher than they could jump. They're not hearing the word that will free them and set them free. They're not buying into the true gospel of Jesus Christ. I said yesterday, I don't know if everybody heard or not, but I, I asked myself a question and I've been asking myself the question for some time. What, I, what happened to the gospel? What happened to the word of God? That when somebody knelt down at the altar, when they accepted Jesus Christ in their life, they got up and they walked a new life. They started in the right direction. They started a new chapter in our life. I say let's bring it back. Let's stop buying in to the things of religion and buying into the things of the world because there's so much out there that people are buying into they can't really separate themselves. Amen. I knew when 
I got saved. Amen. Amen. See, that was the battle. Even though it's been 39 and a half years ago, in many ways it seems like yesterday. Because there's been times in my life over the last 39 years that Satan has tempted me to buy into something else. It could be anything. It could be fear. It could be anger. It could be destructive behaviors. It could be any of those things. It could be any kind of addiction that you could think of. And sometimes in our life, we buy into those things. We allow Satan to destroy that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And so I ask the question, when they went up in the upper room, when they were at Cornelius' house, when they received salvation... Oh my goodness, yeah. they bought into something that was real. You know, we've been, we've been fighting ever since the Garden of Eden. And I, I, I heard this the other day, I was listening to some preaching. And this minister said, when, when Satan was in the garden, Genesis 3.14, and the curse he received, he said... On your belly you shall go in the dust of the earth. You shall eat all the days of your life. I've never thought about that. Not in that sense. He said the curse that Satan received, that the, that the serpent received, he said you shall go on your belly and you shall eat the dust of the earth the rest of the days of your life. Genesis 2 and 7 says, And God formed man from the dust of the earth. And then Peter, 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeking about whom he may devour. Has he or has he not been consuming dust? He says the garden of Eden. Humanity. He, how does he do that? How does he do that? Are you buying what is being sold? How does he do that? Because people buy in to his lies. People buy in to his deception. It's man or Satan or Satan working through man that brings us to this place of bondage. God wants us to be free. God wants us to walk into liberty. I'm telling you, there's a difference in dreading the things of God. If we have not found true salvation, we dread to pray. We dread to go to church. We dread to read God's Word. If Satan is trying to get you to buy into something else, and he's tempting you with something else, and he's trying to get your attention off of the things that's important, and you've allowed maybe your mind to wander in a way that, that God is not pleased with, what happens is you dread all of these things. But when God comes in and sets you free, then you look forward to the things of God. You look forward to praying and fellowship and reading and being in meditation and being together with brothers and sisters. There's a change that takes place. Yeah. See, the lines are so blurred today. The world standards. People are buying into it. I don't know what the number is exactly. But one of the first things that, that came to my mind was abortion. Gay rights. Not, uh, uh, gender identity. All of these things that people... Even our little children. Parents are buying into this lie Amen. and deception. Amen. And little children, three and four and five years old, they're, they're buying in because their parents have allowed media and this, the, the views of this world. They bought into this deception. Yeah. They bought into the deception that we don't know what we are. We don't know what sex we are. We don't know who we are. We don't have an identity. We may... There's even people saying that they're neither one, that they're neither male nor female, but that's not what the Word of God tells me. Brothers and sisters, Satan is trying to get you, get us, get humanity to buy into something that will send them directly to hell. And there's churches, and even in the Beckley area, there's churches that are, are believing and trying to sell that same deception. See, all things are new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. 
The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. That's what happens when we buy in to the gospel. That's what happens when we buy the things that God wants us to buy. He says, now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know what that word reconcile means? It means to set right. It means to bring things back to the proper order. The only way, brothers and sisters, that... I, listen, we have... And I'll just be... I'm, gonna be, I'm just going to be honest. Me and we, including every one of us, there's been times in the last few years we all have just went through the motions We've all bought in to certain things or ideas or understandings or revelations. We've bought into these things. And really we've just, we've just been going through the motions at times in our life when we knew that there was a higher walk, there was a higher call, that God was wanting us to sell out to everything, to sell out our time, to sell out our life, to sell out our children, to say, God, here they are. They belong to you, but we've laid in bed at night and we've worried and we've been afraid. We've let fear, fear grip our heart. We've let our emotions take us places that God is not pleased with. Brothers and sisters, it's time. We said, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for, to, to sell out to you one. 100%. God, whatever you want. Because we're, we're, we've got a ministry, we've got a word of reconciliation to set things back in proper order. God wants us to get to the place where this world no longer means anything to us. He says, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. Have you ever thought, I know we have, God, the God of this universe. Think about the power and the majesty and the holiness and the righteousness and the strength and the knowledge that there is in the eternal God. We cannot imagine, we can't fathom with our minds how big God is. But yet we walk around in this world, on this earth, with God in our hearts. The Bible says if God be for us, who can be against us? That we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. We're not just talking about a God made of stone or a God made of wood. But we're talking about the God of this universe, brothers and sisters. 